you still fall for that old gag? Yeah. Hi, Tim. Good afternoon, Captain. You better call me Dick. We're going to be doing a lot of talking in the next few hours. Fine, that suits me. Let's have a look at the weather. Weather good. Clear and unlimited. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Looking forward to your first ride in the B-26, Jim? Certainly am. Say, it's a break getting into your flight. I've been promoting ever since I first saw you in pre-flight school. Took some doing. Thanks. I hope I'll be a credit to you. You better be. Remember in college when I was your student instructor in math? I took a lot of trouble with you, Dick. If you're as dumb as I was, I'll wash you out. <laughs> There she is. Where's the checklist, Corporal Smith? Sorry, sir, I forgot it. It's our engineer. He's almost as green as you are. Me, green? I had 80 hours of twin engine school. I'm almost ripe enough to be picked. What I can understand is how year after year the Air Corps keeps getting them so young and innocent. Here's the checklist, sir. Take a look, Jim. Since you're going to be a B-26 pilot, that's your Bible. As far as you're concerned, life begins with the checklist. And it may end if you don't use it. The checklist is first in war, first in peace, and the first thing you reach for on a B-26. Understand? No, you take it. I want you to make this check yourself. We'll do the before entering airplane check. Take over. Uh, left landing gear and wheel well check. Well, that uh, U-lock the crew member's removing is a safety precaution we have to prevent anyone from raising the landing gear while the ship's on the ground. You don't mean to tell me that's ever happened. That and worse. Now get on with that checklist and see that none of those other things ever happen to you. Tire for blisters, cuts, proper inflation, slipping on rim. Notice the red mark on your rim. That'll show you if your tires slip. Oil strut for proper extension. Correct? Right. Now maybe here's where I'd better do a little pointing out. There's your gear-operated load and fire valve piston. Make sure it's fully extended. Check brake for excessive heat. Right. Check your brake shuttle valve for looseness. Hydraulic lines for excessive leakage. Down lock pin engaged. Let's go. This is the camera door. Check ballast for proper loading. You must have sufficient ballast back here in order to have a stable airplane. In this case, it's sandbags instead of guns and ammunition, but the weight must be there, whatever it may be. Without the sandbags, the nose is very heavy on landing, and it's impossible to keep from beating up your nose gear. Here's your fire extinguisher. See that it's in position and properly secured. Uh, what do we check on the putt putt? Make sure the equalizer switch is off, and see that all cushions or parachutes are away from the muffler. They might start a fire. Next, right landing gear and wheel well check. You do that yourself, exactly the same as we did the left. Oh, there's the red signal on your Lux fire extinguisher. That's a quick way of knowing from the outside that the extinguisher has not been discharged. Inspection of the nose gear, same as that of the main gear. Go ahead. Trouble Smith, will you get in the cockpit and operate the controls for us? Yes, sir. Now, this next check is to make certain that we always have free and maximum movement of ailerons, elevators, rudder, and attached trim tabs. I'll give the commands to Corporal Smith for operating the controls, and you go back in the rear and check they're working properly. Full left rudder. 
Full right rudder. Rudder trim tab to hold full right rudder. Now all the way left. Turn the wheel all the way left. Now all the way right. Aileron trim tab to lower right wing. Now all the way to lower left wing. Stick all the way back. All the way forward. Elevator trim tab wheel all the way forward. Now all the way back. Set all trim tabs and take off position. Flaps all the way down. Flaps and take off position. Flaps all the way up. All's well with the flipper, Skipper. Good. Incidentally, you always taxi with your flaps in the up position. Did you personally check the air pressure in the emergency Bombay bottle? Yes, sir. It was 1,800 pounds. How were the batteries on the pre-flight inspection this morning? They were well charged, and I entered the readings for the emergency Bombay bottle and the batteries on Form 1A. Good. Have one of you men get in and get ready to start the putt-putt. Yes, sir. You understand the purpose of the putt-putt, don't you, Jim? Yeah. It gives it right here on the checklist. All engine starts will be made with an auxiliary power plant or an external source of electrical power except an emergency. Conserve electricity until after takeoff. And that's really important. You don't want a heavy drain on your batteries until after your engine driven generators are putting out continuously. And that won't be until you're flying. Putt putt will also come in handy in flight if your generators ever cut out on you. That putt putt seems practically indispensable. It is. Whenever anybody on the ground uses any electrical equipment, the putt putt must be kept running to keep the batteries charged. That's law, like always using a checklist. You must have electricity for the takeoff, especially for the electric props. Well, that's how most runaway props occur, isn't it? Yeah, run down batteries. Well, if we don't call it a runaway prop, it's really an overspeeding engine running away with a fixed pitch prop. Let's see. This is the after entering airplane section. Check flight hydraulic servicing can for full service. Tap it on the side to see if it's full. Then fuel transfer valves. They're in the forward bomb bay. Transfer valves off. Fuel transfer pump off. Fuel valves on. Both of them. Hydraulic tank fully serviced. Bomb rack switches on tanks if extra fuel tanks are carried. On bombs if no tanks are carried. In this case, we're carrying an extra fuel tank, so it's on tanks. The rest of the stuff is in the navigator's compartment. Generator switches off. Check pressure, emergency brake air bottle. That's there under the navigator's table. And check that the valve is open as placarded. And make sure that this bleed valve up here ahead in the cockpit is closed. That's it. emergency hydraulic tank. Make certain it's fully serviced.
Check your hatch hinges and emergency release handle. Sit there in position. Okay. Close them up. Check your safety pins in place. Give me some pressure on the hydraulic hand pump so I can set the parking brake. How long do I keep this up? Well, you can't pump anymore. Until the hydraulic gauge shows the pressure's up. That's okay now. Take a look outside. It hasn't been done within the previous hour. Both props are turned over by hand, two or three revolutions, with the ignition off. Just to clear out any oil that may have settled in the lower cylinder. You've been in the Air Corps long enough, Jim, to know the importance of checking Form 1A. No red diagonals, gas, wing tanks, and one bomb bay full, oil full, no other remarks. What's your serial number? O-9181-62. You say that or dial it. <laughs> Leave your inner side earphone off so we can hear each other. Let's see. Next is the starting engines check. Yeah, watch me. Throttle one eighth open. Cowl flaps open. Wing flap control up. Landing gear control down, lock on. Supercharger low, guard over controls. Oil shutters open. Carburetor air cold. Primers off until actually starting engine. Fuel booster off until ready to start engine. Nose gear emergency control normal, up. Main gear emergency control normal, up. Mixture idle cutoff. Propeller controls high RPM, forward. Selectors automatic, safety's on. Feathering normal to the rear. Battery switches both on. Master ignition switch on. That's the emergency bell button there. On the ground, we use that as a signal to the crew member in the rear to start the putt button. By cutting your battery switches for an instant and looking at your landing gear position indicators, you can tell if your putt putt's putting out juice. Main inverter switch on, spare inverter off, magneto switch on. I'm going to start the left engine first. Clear. Clear. Here's how we get them started, Jim. Start your energizing switch on for about 30 seconds. Booster pump on. Primer on for about five seconds. Then I press the engaging switch. Now it's your job to shove the mixture control to auto rich the moment the engine fires. Throttle back to between 800 and 1,000 RPM till it's warmed up. You'll notice your oil pressure goes up to around 200 pounds. If you don't get any oil pressure within 15 seconds, stop the engine and investigate. Wonderful. You're learning. Auto Rich Anthony, they call me. Okay, now you can turn your boosters off. are warmed up when the oil temperature gauge hits 40 degrees and the oil pressure drops suddenly to normal. The cylinder head temperature gauge will read from 100 to 200 degrees. They're okay now. Then you hit your emergency bell button again. That's a signal to the crew member back there to shut off the putt putt and get out of the airplane. We 
don't turn on the radio till we're ready to taxi out. It's the co-pilot's duty to handle radio conversation. Tower from 7645 on south end of ramp, ready to taxi out for takeoff. Go ahead. 7645 from the tower. Clear to taxi to the north end of the north-south taxi strip and stand by for takeoff. Go ahead. 7645, roger. Ready to go, Corporal? Okay, sir. Tricycle landing gear. The nose wheel must never be turned to an angle of more than 40 degrees to either side. Did you see that red sign on the nose wheel when you inspected the well? Yes, I did, Dick. You'll notice it's easy to taxi the ship, and there's no need for taxiing fat. In making a turn, always keep the inside gear rolling, never bring it to a complete stop, as is often done in airplanes with conventional gear. And keep your eyes open on the ground or in the air. It isn't the airplane, it's what you hit with it. When you park, always make certain that your nose wheel is straight ahead. Otherwise, running up your separate engines, the airplane has a tendency to turn in the direction in which the nose wheel is cocked. The thrust from one of the engines might damage the nose wheel assembly. Corporal Smith is checking now to see if the nose wheel's straight. I get you, Captain. Next is the engine run up and prop check, one engine at a time. Push it up till it's doing 2,000 RPM. Different engines have slightly different manifold pressure readings. Is that the RPM in which you check the max? Yeah. Look at your checklist. That's first. I'm sorry. Put your propeller selector switch and decrease RPM, and watch how the RPM falls off on the tachometer. As soon as you see it drop, return the selector switch to increase RPM, and notice how the tachometer shows increase back to 2,000. Do you hear how the sound of the propeller changes? You can hardly miss it. That's right. Put your propeller selector switch in automatic and test your propeller pitch control handle. Pull it part way back until the RPM decreases 200 revolutions, keeping your eye on the tachometer. Then push it forward, watching the tachometer to see that it returns to 2,000 RPM. The next step is to throttle back to 1,400 and do the same thing with the other engine. Now you run your engines up together to about 1,800. At the same time, checking your manifold pressure against the RPM. Be sure that both engines are putting out approximately the same power. We'll check the generators. If Corporal Smith finds the ammeters are showing more than 10 amps difference, we'll give this airplane back to the crew chief. Generators are okay. Oil temperature is 60 to 80. Oil pressure is 75 to 85. Check. Fuel pressure with booster pumps off, 15 to 17. Check. Turn the boosters on. Yeah. Should be 12 to 17 pounds now. Check. Is the takeoff checklist next? Right. Check instrument panel for placarded operations instructions. Cow flaps. Open for all ground operations. 
Wing flaps down one quarter to one half as required. Remove landing gear control lock. Supercharger low. Oil cooler shutters open except during extremely cold weather. Carburetor air control, cold. Hydraulic pressure, 750 to 950 pounds per square inch. Booster pumps on. Primers off. Nose gear emergency control, normal up. Main gear emergency control, normal up. Mixture control, auto rich. Propeller controls, high RPM, forward. Propeller switches, selector, automatic. Safety on, feathering normal. Batteries on. Are the generator main line switches on, Corporal? Generator's okay, sir. Don't start takeoff of cylinder temperature above 205 degrees centigrade. Rudder and aileron tabs on zero. Elevator trim tab a few degrees tail heavy. Crew in position for takeoff. All set, Corporal? All set, sir. Now you have definite duties during the takeoff. Watch the tachometer and see that it doesn't exceed 2,600 RPM. Your right hand should be bare and ready to handle the propeller switches. Your left hand is used to raise the landing gear. Here's how you put your hand. By keeping your right hand down on the quadrant, you can keep the throttles from creeping back during takeoff. If your tachometer should show an increase above 2,600, say 2,880, put your propeller selector switch in fixed pitch position. Then... Hit your feather switch for about two seconds, being sure to return it to normal position. That's the procedure for correcting an overspeeding engine. The other emergency procedure to be prepared for is a decreasing RPM prop. Your props will be in automatic position, which is normal for takeoff. So if one of them shows a decrease RPM, put the selector switch in increased position and bring the RPM back to 2600. Then leave your selector switch in fixed pitch position. Understand? Yeah. Now, under no condition, retract the wheels until you get a definite signal from me. My hand will be on top of the throttles, and this will be it. Roger. Okay, call the tower. Tower from 7645, north end of north-south taxi strip, ready to take off. Go ahead. 7645 from the tower, stand by. Ship landing. Go ahead. 7645, Wilco. Watch this ship coming in. Give you a chance to see a normal B-26 landing. Notice his nose drop. He's putting his flaps down now. As soon as they're down, he'll check his hydraulic pressure to be sure he has brakes. He establishes a glide of 140 miles per hour and holds it till he gets almost to the ground. Then he flares and comes on in normal landing. The eye holds his nose wheel high and lets it down easy before he loses airspeed control. Then he applies his brakes gradually and turns off the runway. Get the idea? I think so. Shall I call the tower? Yeah. Tower from 7645. Is it clear to take off? Go ahead. 7645 from the tower. You're clear to take off to the south on runway 14. Go ahead. 7645. Roger. I'm going to take off with 44 inches manifold pressure and 2,600 RPM. That's minimum. But if you need it, the manifold pressure can be pushed up to the red mark at 49 inches on this particular model. After the roll is started, you use very little brakes to keep the ship straight. Lateral control should be maintained by the rudder only after you're a short way down the runway. As soon as you can, get the nose wheel off and hold the ship in a slightly nose-high attitude. When you have enough speed, the ship will take off by itself. You don't have to pull it off the ground. And it's got very little torque. You could pull it off at about 110 miles per hour if you were on a short field. But it'll fly itself off at about 130 miles an hour.
2400. What were you watching during the takeoff? Psychometer, manifold pressure gauge, and your thumb. You ever get to be a B-26 pilot? Don't waste any time giving the signal to get that gear up from the moment you're sure you're off the ground. Because? Because when you run out of runway, your landing gear is no good to you. Pretty tough getting to 160 miles per hour till that gear is tucked away. I see what you mean. Well, we're climbing now. We do that at exactly 160 miles per hour until the flaps are raised. The airplane should be at least 800 feet above the ground before you raise it. This is what is known as milking them up. You do it a little at a time, and you keep your hand on the flap handle until the flaps are all the way up. If you don't, and they should come up on one side only, you'll go into the most violent bank you ever saw in your life. But you can stop it by putting the flaps back down again. Can I take my eyes off the tachometer? Yeah. Put them on the hydraulic controls. It's time to neutralize them. All air work is done with cowl flaps, wing flaps, landing gear, and oil cooler shutters in neutral position at all times in order to prevent loss of hydraulic fluid from the entire system in case one of the individual lines develops a serious leak. Turn off your boosters. Airspeed indicator says we're picking up speed. With the flaps up, the ship changes its attitude. You'll notice our nose has come up a bit and gains about 10 miles per hour. With the cow flaps half closed and the oil cooler flaps half closed, it streamlines the airplane to the, to the extent that it picks up about five miles per hour more. But you must not forget that these controls should be handled in accordance with cylinder head and oil temperature. Really claws her way right up into those clouds, doesn't she? You fly for a while, Jim. Get the feel of the controls. See how easily she handles. Nice. Try some shallow dives and climbs, a couple of gentle turns. Controls are easy, aren't they? Smooth as a GI haircut. Easy to coordinate, too. Hey, you're skidding, sonny boy. Take a look at that turn and bank indicator. What cause is that? Something I forgot to tell you. The plane has a very sensitive rudder, and you'll skid on all your turns if you don't correct for them. Try it again. Another advantage of the B-26 is that it can be dived up to 325 miles per hour with a heavy load and pulled out without an appreciable strain on the airplane. But diving is about your one luxury. Side slips, vertical banks, and all acrobatics are prohibited maneuver. I'll try to go straight and level, Dick. Try a 40-degree bank. That's the maximum. By the way, the B-26 is a good airplane to go to war in. It's got plenty of power, plenty of armor plate, and plenty of guns. I'm beginning to think it's a good plane to go anywhere in. Let me take over for a minute. I want to show you a power-off stall. Power-on stalls are prohibited in the B-26. This one will be with the nose not over 10 degrees above the horizon. miles per hour with the flaps and landing gear retracted. About 115 miles per hour with the flaps down, and about 100 miles an hour with flaps and landing gear down. Notice the pronounced shuddering just before the stall. You also feel the lack of control when the control surfaces are moved. These are important points to remember since it means that the airplane will always give you plenty of warning.
Another advantage is that it falls straight forward from this type of stall with no tendency to drop off on either wing. Of course, in power on or nose high stalls, it may fall off on one wing. Normal stall recovery is very simple. You just put the nose down and let the ship pick up speed by itself. Loading is an important consideration in respect to stalling. If the ship is improperly loaded, the tail is too heavy and therefore the center of gravity too far to the rear, it will affect the stalling characteristics of the airplane by making it stall at a higher speed and with less warning. Improper loadings also have to put you into a spin. That spin business fascinates me. Just how do you get out of one? Cut your power off and make a normal spin recovery. Don't be slow and cautious in the movement of your controls during recovery. And avoid getting impatient waiting for the controls to take effect. Sometimes they need a little while before they begin to work. The only way you can judge time is by counting the number of turns made. Don't use your throttle except as a last resort. When you're free of the spin, pull out gradually or you're apt to tear your wings off. What about mental spins? How do I pull out of them? gases. Look at that B-26 moving in on us. Yeah, we'll have to keep our eye on him. Transfer gas to the main tanks. I'm going on instruments for a minute, and I want you to keep your eye on that B-26 from my side while I'm flying blind. Yes, sir. Hand me the blind flying hood.
wheels in sight. Do you think we can make it? I think so. I'm going to feather that dead engine. Watch me. The ignition switch is left on until the propeller has stopped turning. I center my ball and needle and slow up to 155, increasing my trim as I do. Isn't that a lot of trim, Dick? You need it because of the natural torque of the operating engine. Going on the right engine requires about five degrees more trim than if you were going on the left. The slower I go, the more trim I need. But I've got to watch that needle and ball while trimming. What's the airspeed? 155. Between 150 and 160 is correct. 155 is plenty fast for single engine operation. Shall I give them the bad news back at the tower? Tower from 7645. I'm about eight miles west of field, 4,000 feet, operating on a single engine. Request instructions for emergency landing. Go ahead. 7645 from the tower. The field is clear for emergency landing. Wind is south 10. Go ahead. 7645, Roger. Now? No, not until I'm positive I'm going to overshoot. 
Okay, full flap. I picked up some speed on my dive, and I'll have to lose it by holding the nose up and letting the ship scoot. Interesting, Captain. I hope you committed that reasonable facsimile of a single engine and approach to memory. Well, I certainly did. Say, by the way, what would you have done if you'd had to stop in a hurry and didn't have any hydraulic pressure? I'd have had you give me more pressure on the hydraulic hand pump. If that hadn't worked, I'd have pulled the emergency air bottle, which is connected directly with the brakes. Well, that's the fastest stop you can make, huh? No, well, there's an even faster one. If you're going to run into something or the field is slick and you can't get any traction on your wheels, you can, as a last resort, pull back your mixture controls, cut your switches, and raise your landing gear. That'll stop you, but it's a little hard on the airplane. One more question, Dick. Suppose we hadn't been able to make our home field. We'd have picked out any field that was fairly flat and free from obstructions, brought the ship in on its belly. Aside from the wheels being up, the landing would have been the same as the one we made. I know, but uh, what about getting out? Well, if we'd had time, we'd have got out of our parachutes and pushed the seats forward to get out of the path of the propeller in case one of the blades should break off when it hits the ground. Then just before we touched, I'd have pushed the mixture controls back to idle cutoff cut the switches to keep down the fire hazard. And the minute she touched, we'd have got the top hatches open, and then we'd have all got up and quickly walked away. landing to report. Yes, the tower informed me you were coming in and I watched you. It was a good job. Thank you, sir. Those simulated single engine approaches you've been making came in handy for you, didn't they? Yes, sir. The airplane was undamaged and there were no personnel injuries. What was the reason for the engine failure? It was a personnel failure, sir. No. Sit down, gentlemen. Corporal Smith, our engineer, made a mistake in turning on the fuel transfer pump, emptying the left main tank instead of filling it. However, it was more my fault than his because I had him watching a nearby plane while I flew on instruments and I neglected to keep an eye on my fuel gauges. And where were you? 
Sandbagging in the co-pilot seat, sir. Sandbagging is right. That's another lesson for your collection, Captain. Live and learn. And I hope neither of you will forget it. I'm positive that Corporal Smith, or rather Private Smith, will not, since he's going to get some KP duty in which to meditate upon his sins. How do you like the B-26, Lieutenant? I'm not kicking, sir. Hmm. Only our enemies are. 